Hello and welcome to another slice of Daily Bread. I'm so glad that you've joined us today for Daily Bread. Now today's devotional will be brought to us by Pastor Steve Wallaconis. Pastor Steve, as always, welcome to Daily Bread. Thank you very much. Now, as we always do, before we begin, we'd like to open with a word of prayer. So, so bow your heads with us. Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for your many blessings. And Lord, we just pray that uh, as we open your word, as we study, that your spirit will bless us as we do so. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A Chinese man named Li Fuan had tried every treatment imaginable to ease his throbbing headaches. Nothing helped. Finally, a simple x-ray revealed the culprit. A rusty four-inch knife blade had been lodged in his skull following an attack by a robber. In the attack, Fuan had suffered lacerations on the right side of his jaw, but he didn't know the blade had broken off inside his head. Miraculously, it missed all the big vessels and structures. Surgeons took it out, and that was the end of that, along with his headaches. We can't live with foreign objects in our bodies or our souls. What would an x-ray of your interior reveal? Regrets? Remorse over a poor choice? Shame over a bad habit you can't quit? The temptation you didn't resist? Or the courage you couldn't find? Guilt lies hidden beneath the surface festering, irritating, stabbing, sometimes so deeply embedded you don't even know the cause. The most dreadful pain that can disturb any soul is the fear of being condemned by the judge of all the earth. What must have been like for Belshazzar to see that handwriting on the wall, which condemned him as weighed in the balances and found wanting, spelling out his doom that very day. Though condemnation is the most fatal of all ills, the Apostle Paul, in the confidence of his faith, dares ask in Romans 8.34, Who is he who condemns? He challenges all heaven and earth. With confidence in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, he looks up to the excellent glory and to the throne of God, and even in the presence of God he dares to inquire, who is he who condemns? How had Paul become so completely delivered from all fear of condemnation? Was it because he had come to a false peace by minimizing transgression? Was it because he made excuses, causing his sins to appear little? Was it because he quieted his fears by putting confidence in anything he had himself done? Was it because he had suffered and endured so much for Christ's sake? No. He gives no hint of having found peace by any of those things. But in the humble spirit of a true believer in Jesus, he builds his hope of safety upon the work of his Savior. He looks completely away from himself and finds all his reasons for rejoicing by looking to Jesus, his substitute. It's a very common thing for people to feel the cold chill of condemnation due to their doubts, and fears, and awareness of their failings. But for us here today, the Spirit of God has warm comfort for our hearts in four timeless truths regarding our salvation, all arising from what we find in the scripture text of Romans 8:34. First off, you as a believer cannot be condemned because Christ has died. It reads, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. 
the believer has Christ for his substitute. And upon that substitute, his sin has been laid. Our Lord Jesus Christ, by his death, has suffered the penalty for our sin. Therefore, if the Lord has been condemned for us, how can we be condemned? If the punishment has been meted out to a substitute, it's neither consistent with mercy nor justice that the penalty should be administered a second time. Who was it that died? Christ Jesus, the Son of God, died. Our substitute was no mere man. He who carried our sins to the cross was God over all. The name Christ means the anointed. He did not come to us unsent or uncommissioned. He came by the Father's will. God himself appointed and anointed Christ to suffer and die. God himself initiated the plan of substitution and commissioned the substitute to do his work. He came with his Father's anointing, which was signified at his baptism. And the Father will never repudiate what he so initiated and completed in the person of Christ. So then, the first truth for today is that sin cannot condemn you because Christ died. He descended into the grave and slept within the tomb, really dead. He has paid all that was due, for he has paid with his life. He suffered, and you will not suffer. He was condemned, and you will not be condemned. Romans 8.34 now adds a second argument. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, is also risen. That word, furthermore, strengthens the argument. If the death of Christ was a basis for the apostles' hope, the resurrection yields even greater comfort and hope, because the resurrection denoted his total clearance from all the sin that was laid upon him. Think of it this way. A certain woman is overwhelmed by debt. How will she ever be discharged from her liabilities? A very good man, a friend, out of his great love for her, marries her. No sooner is the marriage ceremony performed than she is by that very act clear of debt, because all her debts are now her husband's. And in taking her, he takes all her obligations. And that is a wonderful comfort to her, of course. But she's even more comforted when her beloved goes to her creditors, pays them all, and brings her the receipts. First off, she's comforted by the marriage but much more so when her husband is himself rid of all the liability which he assumed. Even so, in death, our Savior took our debts. But there is more. The resurrection of Christ was the Father's declaration that he was satisfied with the Son's atonement. Being fully accepted, he was risen, and all his people are thereby justified. What if Christ had not risen? Paul's answer is this. And if Christ is not risen, then your preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. And if Christ is not risen, 
Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 17. So then, the resurrection is a second antidote to the fear of condemnation. Now a third point follows in our verse. Romans 8, 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God. Bear in mind that what Jesus is, his people are, for they are one with him. His condition and position represent their own. The verse says that Jesus is at the right hand of God. That signifies love, for the right hand is for the beloved. Who shall sit at the right hand of God but one who is dear to God? That means honor and acceptance. To which of the angels has he given the honor to sit at his right hand? That also implies power. No cherub or seraph can even be said to be at the right hand of God. Who is he who condemns? While my substitute sits near to God, how can I be condemned? I am by faith where he is. Ephesians 2, 6 says, God has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The right hand of God is a place so near, so eminent, so safe, that one cannot imagine an adversary bringing a charge against us there. Remember the story of Haman? who conspired against the life of Queen Esther and her people. What was he thinking? How could he ever think to prevail over one so dear to the king's heart? And neither can our adversary condemn or destroy those who are dearer to God than Queen Esther ever was to King Ahasuerus, because by faith they sit at his right hand. The last truth that frees us from the fear of condemnation follows as well in our text for today, Romans 8, 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. This is another reason why fear of condemnation should never cross our minds. Jesus is no humble petitioner. What he asks for will never be in vain. And it is not that he must sigh and moan from a distance, asking for what he does not deserve. Rather, <clears throat> as our heavenly high priest, he would have us remember the meaning of the breastplate sparkling with the jewels engraved with the names of his people, and also the presenting of his own blood shed as an infinitely satisfactory atonement. If Abel's blood crying from the ground was heard in heaven, how much more will the blood of Christ secure the pardon and salvation of his people? The plea of Jesus is indisputable. Can the infinite justice of God deny the plea of his own son? When Jesus pleads, it is not only the dignity of his person that has weight, but also the love which the Father holds toward the Son. How safe the Christian really is. Will you trust your substitute who has made the way to heaven clear and sure? This is something to celebrate, and let us do just that as we pray. 
<coughs> kind Father, we thank you for the precious message of that one verse in the Bible, which assures us of your great love and sacrifice for us and the results that occurred as a result. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you came to die for us. And the meaning of your death on the cross is a teaching and a truth that is so vast and great and incomprehensible. How great is the mercy and love of our God for us in sending Jesus to die for us. And I pray that we might today give you our heart. May we surrender ourselves and accept you as our Lord and Savior. Thank you for these precious words. Thank you for the comfort they give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>